Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow, that's uh, that's better. Than, can I can I steal that? That's better than my introduction. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> all, I have, all I have to say to that is octopoo. <laughs> octopoo. Octopoo. So yeah, it's um you know I've been listening to you doing this and I, I, I was always impressed because you do this completely off the cuff and you I mean you must have been doing this for years and you, how long have you been doing DJing. Like being, uh, I, I am not even kidding. Since I was, uh, I used to, uh, I used to DJ school dances when I was twelve. Yeah, I so get you. You're, you're a vinyl junkie as well, aren't you? I was vinyl junkie. We did. Yeah. I mean, eighth grade, we used to have like lunchtime dances, and I would DJ, uh, you know, school dances, and then all through. And then at nineteen, I was underage working in clubs in uh, Nevada, actually uh, uh, DJing, and then. Uh, and then I worked at Hands Old Place for years, and then I was a DJ at, uh, and then I had a club called Vertigo in uh, downtown LA that we eventually sold to Prince. So it just went on and on. I, you know, I got out of it just when, just when DJs started becoming superstars. Just when, I mean, I went to a concert to see Moby, and I was like, oh my god, this is like the <laughs> stupidest thing I've ever seen. He, he, he's just like, really, I'm just watching a guy play records? That's what I'm doing? And, uh, and now you have these superstar DJs out there who mix all the stuff like, uh, I don't know, like Danger Mouse or whoever it is, and, uh, and Moby and all that, but no, I've DJed for for years, and then uh, you know doing the radio stuff has been uh, oh, a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah, so um, I've, I've never heard you stuck for a word or anything like that. Uh, you, you've got the, uh, the kind of the gab thing. Oh yeah, that's right. I was gonna I, going, I was gonna add something about Blarney that you know Blarney comes along and kisses you or something like that. But anyway, that's good. <laughs> that's actually my grandmother is from Blarney. Oddly mm-hmm. enough, she's actually from Fork. Well, there you go. So, uh, there you go. That's from what... right. From right outside where the castle, oh, so she, the family farm is right outside where the castle is, where, where McCarthy Castle is, right there in, uh, right there in Blarney, where the stone is hidden. So, but there's a, that's there's a whole story to that as well, because they push it up on the inside of the, of the castle wall, so that's why you've got to go underneath and you know kiss it on the inside, because they were, they were hiding it from the bloody English, you know. Oh yeah, well, we know we know all about these bloody English. Yeah, yeah, I'd say I'm I'm English-ish. I wasn't I was born there, but uh, I'm not really. Very English at all. Uh, now you're, yeah, now you're in Scotland, so you're you're a, a civilized man living amongst the barbarians. In Scotland. <laughs> oh, they're lovely people. I mean, there's there's uh, there's a Vi- I'm I'm seven miles south of Burghead, which is a Viking colony, and uh, there's you know the place is full of redheads, of course, you know. Oh, um, of course, yes. And um, <laughs> there's this intense guy. What's his name? Um, Jimmy the Hip. Uh, is there's, there's, there's he's actually on YouTube there. He's just a very he, he's a <laughs> dark looking guy, you know. I tend to what I see the aura, you know. <laughs> anyway, some great some great characters here in this place. Um, I, is the, the Scottish are weird because you know my my wife is Scottish and uh, yeah, is she weird? weird is she a proper Ouija? I mean, does she actually? I mean, does she actually have a yeah. Scottish accent? And you know, no, no, no. She's, no, she her, but her 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 grandfather. Uh, that was sold. I, I, I told you the story. He mm-hmm. was from. Uh, they were all from uh, uh, from Glasgow, mm-hmm. and uh, and he sold the. He had the formula for Seven Up, and he sold it for I don't know four hundred quid or something like that. And and they came over to America, and for whatever reason, came across the plains and converted to Mormonism. Yes. And um, but yeah, her 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 grandma and grandfather were like right off the boat from from Scotland. After mm-hmm. he sold the Seven Up recipe, I guess, and then came to America, and uh, but they, <laughs> the Scots is they, you know they they love you one minute and hate you the next. It's very funny. It's like oh, I love you more than life itself. What you got mud on your boots? Oh, you have mud on I'll kill you now. You have mud up on your carpet. But I love you so much. Very kind. You know, that's why, and very sensitive. Yes. Well, that's why that story that we were reading about you know about <laughs> the funniest story I've read out of Scotland. Twenty five reasons why we love oh, the yeah. Scots. <laughs> that that oh, the poo story about the guy who didn't wipe. Is behind and then sat on his on his bride's lap and left a big skin mark on her wedding dress, which then she punches him and he punches her and and then both sides of the family go at it in the temperance hall and they all wind up in jail. Is uh, that's that's Glasgow? That, that's, that's yeah, that's Glasgow. Glasgow. And you know they charge they charge you extra if the, <laughs> if if the party gets that fun they charge you extra for it. Well, they say that, that you have more fun at a Glasgow funeral than an Edinburgh wedding. That's I can imagine. That's because uh, one's a happy occasion. <laughs> so, so let's 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 uh, let's delve. Okay, so um, there you are. Ivy League banter. Yes, there you are. You know, um, growing up with your um, you know DJ and mullet and all that stuff and. 
being being popular at the at the never uh, never, the, never rocked the mullet. Didn't have the mullet. <laughs> I did go for the I did I did go for the perm I think at one time because uh, once again I wanted to look like Tom Baker Doctor Who so uh, all right so yeah you've been a, a major Doctor Who fan I mean you're just like about a year older than me so we kind of grew up with the same sort of TV influences and uh, yes. and uh, I remember the Time Tunnel and I certainly remember Doctor Who and sort of, uh, all through my life Doctor Who's been a feature apart from the middle bit with those funny guys who are more like more like clowns than yeah uh, they call than it, the Doctor yeah. Colin Baker, Sylvester yeah. McCoy, and yeah. that sort of dropped the radar. Peter Peter Davidson was the guy who really killed it, and it's yeah. funny because his his daughter is married to David Tennant. Did you know that? All oh, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, you funny. are a right. vinyl junkie, aren't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. David Tennant, and yeah. Peter Davidson, who was like the seventh Doctor, I think it was. His, yeah, yeah. his daughter's married to David Tennant, which yeah. I think is just kind of funny. It's a kind of dynasty so, um, thing, isn't it? This is be well, see, but you you were in England, mm. and I I lived in London for. A while, so mm-hmm. I'm watching, you know, Doctor Who and the Monty Python stuff and uh, uh, Riley Ace of Spies. I'm not sure if you remember that. It was Sam Neill? Mm-hmm. Remember Riley Ace of Spies way yeah, back? It was like eighty one, eighty two, or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I had a lot of uh, British television, and it was also strange as well because I knew when I lived in London, I worked for uh, I worked for Playboy. I was because a, I was, an did, ad yeah. copy. <laughs> I was an ad copy guy for Playboy uh-huh. because my uh, my college girlfriend. Uh, her uncle was, or is, continues to be, uh, Victor Lowndes, who is the uh, co-founder of Playboy with Hefner, and he had the, and he was the wealthiest man. He was, he was the highest paid executive in the UK, and he had the Playboy Mansion Europe in the city of Tring, which is about, and it actually was Aldous Huxley's forty room mansion, which was the Playboy Mansion Europe, which was just crazy, and so. Um, I knew all the Monty Python guys, and I used to babysit for John Cleese's daughter, Cynthia, <laughs> who is now married to Ed Solomon, who's like the, the top screenwriter in Hollywood. Uh, Ed's, he wrote X-Men and, uh, Men in Black, and, you know, he's a, he's a big, big deal. But, uh, so I knew, you know, I knew all these people. Mm-hmm. I knew, you know, George, Har- George Harrison and John Cleese and Graham Chapman and, uh, Mickey Palin and, uh, uh, wrote a treatment. Wrote a treatment for a, a for a movie called the the uh, uh, the man who sold time, uh, which they turned into Time Bandits and totally stole. But it's uh you know that's which which won an Academy Award for best original story idea. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, there's this really. I think you guys play. You could play characters down through time. And there's a guy who, uh, you know, who who builds this machine to reinvent the universe. And you know, they completely stole it. So it's. Uh, <laughs> but what can you do? So anyway. all through time, this story has been leaking out. And uh, it is about. I mean, the let let's let's move into the sands of time territory because yeah, okay. there's this there's this chance meeting or I mean you knew this guy when you were growing up. Um, or well, he he, was, knew, he uh, knew of you. I mean, well, you, he, you're, you were quite uh, active. At the t- yeah. So so let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how it go ahead, went. Go ahead. Go ahead. The. the uh, um, the first about ten years of my life or so, I was a I was kind of an interesting Southern California Hollywood kid, because my my father was the uh, was the vice president for customer communications. Basically, he was he was public relations director for TRW, and TRW is a gigantic corporation that was actually later bought by Northrop, but TRW built most of the stuff that allowed us to go to the moon. They built the lunar module. They had they had huge hangars where they built the Saturn V, the lunar modules. Uh, which of interest, uh, because it all, there's a, there's a corner close to me, which is, which is Rosecrans and aviation. And on one corner was Mattel, where they invented all the Mattel stuff, you know, Hot Wheels and, and all the toys. On the other corner, corner is Xerox, where they invented the personal computer that was then stolen by Steve Jobs and, and Gates. All the designs. X Windows. You know, for yeah. the mouse, for the desktop, for the window, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the whole interface. You know, and, and Gates used to joke about, you know, I took it out the front door and you took it out the back door, but, you know, we know we stole all the stuff from Xerox. And then the other corner is TRW. And TRW had these big hangars, and the hangars have now been converted into film studios. And now it's Marvel Studios, where they shoot the Avengers and uh, Captain America and Thor and all that. So this one corner is responsible for so much industry and interesting things. So my... Um, I have two godfathers who walked on the moon, uh, David Scott and Jack Schmidt, Harrison Jack Schmidt, who was the senator for, U.S. Senator for New Mexico. My little brother's godfather is Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon. 
And uh, so we knew all the astronauts. Uh, Gordon Cooper married my the fastest man alive, married my mother's best friend Trixie, and they were always at the house. And my my father also had a uh, uh, a nightclub, which was called the uh, uh, Jerry Morton's International Turtle Club, which uh, Wally Shira at that time was uh, was was the co-founder of it. And we were good friends with Walter Cronkite and all these people, and we used to have these celebrity uh, tennis tournaments and all this. So we knew all these, you know, we used to hang out on the set of Laugh-In, and my mother for a period of time was engaged to Dick Martin and Rowan Martin's Laugh-In, so she knew him. and oh, So we just knew all these people. Very before, interesting. Before my parents, I mean, the first girl that ever kissed me was Goldie Hawn. I was six years old, and Goldie Hawn lays a big smack around me. And I was like, oh, girls are icky. And I thought they were icky right up until Goldie Hawn kissed me on the face. And I was like, okay, they're not so bad now. Um, so my, so I have this Hollywood existence. Then my, then my parents get divorced. And, you know, and then I, we live in like, I'm the only white kid living in, you know, I mean, black and Mexican ghettos and fight my way to school every day and being the only white kid in these classes. Uh, which goes on for a couple of years. Then my mother marries a you know very wealthy uh, 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 Jewish businessman from Northern California. But the way it all worked was is that I knew because we used to have these panels. I knew people like Gene Roddenberry. Uh, I, I mean, I remember one panel that my father hosted that had uh, Gene Roddenberry, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, uh, Rod Serling. You know, all these people talking about the future of where we were going to go with all of this. So he, there was that military industrial connection there. With, uh, you know, on any given day, my dad would be on a boat selling rockets to, uh, to, you know, to various generals or, you know, whatever else. I remember getting in a big fight with him because there were some Chinese generals that they, were, that they were selling missiles to. And I was like, oh, great. So they're all going to be pointed at us, you know, and don't you feel a little bad about that? So then I get involved in, uh, throughout the 80s, uh, about 90, in 1990, I work on a, on a UFO documentary, which is called UFO Contactees. It was a paying gig. And I was a director and producer, and our on-camera guy was a guy named Joe Rendazzo, and he had about $250,000 of his own money. And we traveled around the world for geez, about six months or so, just doing nothing but interviewing UFO contactees, abductees, scientists, researchers. Somebody had a dog that barked at the UFO. We went out and talked to them. We went to... Um, I mean, we went to Switzerland, to Billy Meyer's farm in Switzerland, and, and interviewed Billy Meyer, and I became good friends with Billy and, and his son, Methuselah, and, you know, I hosted Methuselah when he came here. He used to stay at my house when he was here, so, you know, knowing all these people that are in direct contact with the Palladians and all that, we went up and down Italy, Spain, France, we were actually in the, cro we were actually in England at Stonehenge in May of 1990 when the modern crop circle phenomenon began, when the, when the original first circle started. We were actually camping out in the fields while these amber gamblers are, uh, flying over us creating, then were just circles before they, before they started becoming, uh, you know, signals or, or glyphs, if you will. So in 19, in 1990, uh, as part of this documentary, we interview Bob Lazar. And Bob Lazar was a scientist who had worked at Area 51 and had just recently come out of there saying that I worked in an area called S4. There were nine craft or ship that we shot down or got some kind of deal uh, with the extraterrestrials. He described them. He said there was a hole burned through one of them, and this one looked like this and that and the other thing. And he was there for a grand total, I think, of about six weeks from December of 88 through about January, February or, or so, actually until about May of 89, uh, working on and off at this facility. Um, he went public with George Knapp at the time, uh, where, where Knapp had interviewed him and he was recognized, even though they blacked him out, he was recognized by somebody at the base, uh, a very evil uh, guy named uh, uh, Captain Dennis Mariana who threatened him and said, you know, well, you have any idea what your life's going to be like now? You know, we're going to kill you slow and kill everybody you know. So he went public and said, if anybody dies or if I die, you'll know that this uh, that this is true about Area 51. So, they, you know, he went public with the whole thing. So when we interviewed him in 1990, he said, look, you don't have to believe a word I say. All you need to do is you go out to Highway 375 by the uh, mile 18 marker by this black mailbox, the Steve Medlin's black mailbox by the side of the road, and go out on Wednesday nights, which is when they test, and you'll see flying saucers. Bottom line, don't believe anything I say. Go for yourself. So it took a year for me to get out there, and I took a friend of mine from the L.A. Times, a girl named Shannon Sands, who worked for the uh, as a reporter for the uh, for the L.A. Times and a photographer. And it was a it was a, a dark and stormy night out there up in the up in the mountains. And uh, 
uh, I was in a car with a with a friend of mine named Jeff Slack, and uh, Shannon and his photographer were in the car in front of us. Very foggy. You could you couldn't see like six feet in front of your face. And we got stopped by the sheriff going up this road, and the sheriff said, "You got to turn around. They're they're doing testing." Uh, this is a gunnery range. And I said, you know, and I held up a map and said, what, you mean the thing that's not on the map? And he goes, yeah, wise guy, just turn your car around. You can't go up this way. So Shannon turns around. They tear off their way up in front of us. Jeff and I are coming back down the road. And uh, long story short, the the fog clears out in a, in a big gout, if you will, in a, in a clear spot. And the car gets swooped by a flying saucer, a, 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 a disc that's about 60 feet across. And this thing comes in on, its, on an angle. Uh, literally rotates on his edge, flattens out, and, and just takes up the middle of the road, just sits in the middle of the road. And we crash the car into the side of the road. And we go chasing after this thing, and we got our faces burned by it and uh, uh, got radiation sickness from it, you know, and the whole thing from getting buzzed by this uh, by this craft. So after that, I was kind of hooked, and then I... It's like, how long did the did the, the burns last, you know? Oh, it was weird, because the doctor said, what'd you do, stick your head in the microwave? Because, you know, we had hats on, and our faces were all burned. I mean, we looked like, you know, Richard Dreyfuss out of Close Encounters. and uh, But deathly ill, really weird. High temperatures, vomiting, uh, a lot of really strange stuff. Uh, you know, to this day, I don't know if my thyroid gland is, is completely blown out from, you know, whatever happened at that time. But, uh, so I started going back every couple of weeks or so, and then I found a hilltop. This was May... Of, uh, of 91, yeah, 91, I found the hilltop that then looked down on the base. And I was like, oh my god, I can see their house from here, and I can see the base. And, and that was a big deal, because nobody had seen the base for years after they'd taken these low-lying mountains. So I get with a buddy of mine who brings out a video camera, and we hide out up there under camouflage and the whole thing, and we film the base and, uh, a bunch of ships and saucers and what we thought was a disc, and, and you've, you've seen this on every TV show about Area 51. Uh, there's something something coming into the fog that we get all excited about, and then we we find out it's just a plane. And you know, on the table, we're just like, oh, it's a plane. We can see the lights going on. And there's been people that say, oh, Sean Morton claims a UFO, and you know, he's a big liar. And <laughs> you don't look, you don't watch the whole tape. You know, the whole thing says, oh, it's a plane. It just it looks weird in the fog, and then all the lights come on as this thing lands out in front of this giant hangar. So um, so I was the only person that knew what the base looked like for a period of time. Then, interestingly enough, um, a man who called himself Ghost Walker. This is where it gets really strange. A guy who calls himself Ghost Walker, uh, whose name was, he had a bunch of aliases, but he called himself Connor Hennessy, I think, at the time. But he had a couple of different aliases. And um, he claimed to be an assassin who had something like 60 kills and... Uh, in his spare time, when he wasn't out murdering people for the government, he had a, a, a security job actually out at Area 51. Now, apparently, uh, 5 1, as they call it, is a, a pretty, it's a pretty bougie assignment because underground, the, the food is five star. I mean, they're serving like lobster every day. Uh, they've got, you know, they've got bowling alleys. They've got, uh, underground baseball diamonds, uh, uh, apparently it's a, you know, it's an amazing it's an amazing resort underground there so it's a, it's pretty bougie uh, uh, you know pretty bougie territory there and he was one of the people that was one of the security guards that had access to what was called level five which they called the ambassadorial suites which was out at S four and level five was apparently where they were keeping uh, uh, at that time they were keeping a, a series of uh, alien bodies and specimens and he described them. Uh, in uh, blue tubes of liquid with uh, standing up with uh, uh, with uh, silver uh, bands across the uh, the chest and the uh, and the uh, the hip area of these beings and they they had some tall whites they had some Pleiadians they had some greys they had some reptilians uh, apparently in this level five and at, at some point he also explained that they had a couple of living extraterrestrials as well so. I was the only one that had seen the base. So for about six months or so, I was vetting out these people because I knew if they'd work there or not because I knew what it looked like because I had it on film and nobody else knew what it looked like. So he described what the base was. And it was a very strange thing because it was also at the time I was working for uh, uh, Geraldo Rivera. And I had a friend at Geraldo. And Geraldo had a show called Now It Can Be Told. I'm not sure if I'm getting the, getting the uh, whole thing correct here. But he came out, he went through a, a number of researchers like Wendell Stevens, uh, and then another scientist, and the scientist claims that he was, that they put a gas into his house and that he was like frozen or paralyzed and that they looted his house while he was uh, conscious, but couldn't do anything about it. And then this guy and his girlfriend were heading towards me, 
and they stayed at my house for a week. And all I can tell you is this guy was about six four, blonde hair, gold eyes, big scar across his face. Uh, could do physical things that were superhuman. I mean, I saw him. I saw him from a, a from a, a standing stop. Uh, jump about 15 feet in the air. I mean, literally just jump up onto a, uh, up onto a lifeguard stand, onto the roof of a lifeguard stand, and then jump back down again. So he can do some uh, weird things, and it claims it's from these various steroids and stuff that they put into his body, but I mean, this guy had me terrified for about a week. I slept with a gun under my pillow for, uh, for a week or so while this guy was at my house. And his claim was is that he had 450 pages of documents that were going to blow the lid off this entire deal. And uh, so we went back out to Las Vegas. I'm in contact with the people from Geraldo. Uh, he wants to get paid. The Geraldo people say, if you give us the documents, we'll pay you. Uh, and there's a, there was a whole big kind of, you know, kind of monkeys in a barrel thing where he gave me a key, and I went to a bus station to go find a locker, and it turned out the entire row of lockers had disappeared, even though I had the key for the lockers, and the bus master was like, wait, this is impossible. And I'm standing out in front of the Flamingo Hotel with armed security teams to get this guy to safety with supposedly all these documents. And he disappears, and I never see him again. Uh, the next time we hear from him, I, we hear that he's actually then infiltrating the, uh, I guess you would call it the sovereign citizens movement. And that, uh, and this, this is where it got really weird, that he was in Texas at Elohim City, and that he was infiltrating other groups that he'd made a deal with the government uh, and they were trying to get these Patriot people to blow up a government building. This was before Oklahoma City, mind you, about a year before, to blow up a government building so they could pin it on the uh, uh, on the Freedom people. So about that time, uh, I'm approached at, uh, at an expo uh, by a guy who has access, who knows a lot of stuff. And uh, it turns out that this uh, that this gentleman becomes uh, the, the, the character in the book as as Ted Humphrey. So it was a person that I'd had... Uh, who knew my dad, who knew, uh, was familiar with what was going on with TRW, uh, knew what was going on with the Ghost Walker thing, you know, apparently understood what was going on with my trying to talk about Area 51 and get the technology out because, you know, my attitude with 5.1 was, look, it doesn't matter if there's little green men out there, they've got technology that can change the world, and if they could release this technology to the public, uh, because w- once again, once you release, once you, once you understand what gravity is, not what it does, because that's what we know. We, we know what it does. We know what its effects are. We have the Newtonian and Einsteinian aspects of gravity. Once you can create gravity as a wave, very much like a microwave or a gamma ray, gamma ray uh, you're done. Because then now you're talking about teleportation. You're talking about uh, aspects of time travel. You're talking about dealing with mass without having to worry about weight. Now you're talking uh, like motherships that are miles long or floating cities into space or uh, entire space stations in the atmosphere. Because the minute you start dealing with actually what gravity is, everything shifts and changes. So over the course of the years, uh, the interesting part about this was is that now I'm, I'm going on uh, Coast to Coast AM. And uh, Art Bell, who was basically a, just a right-of-center talk show host who was just blabbing away in the middle of the night, uh, he was the only guy that was on the air that we know of that we could pick up on our radio, and, and we started calling him on the phone, kind of as a joke, really, uh, to call him on the phone out in front of uh, the little alien, uh, which is in the town of Rachel, which is about 18 miles from uh, uh, from Area 51, and we started calling him and started telling him about stuff that we were seeing. And Art said to me, I, I want to know everybody that you know. I want to know, and I handed him my database, which then led to guests like Richard Hoagland and Daniel Brinkley and you know all his big superstar guests and all that. And between Art and I, uh, Art built a show that had a listenership at that time in the middle of the night worldwide of about 26 million people or so. So it became, I became a pretty interesting conduit, and this also led to uh, my dealing with guys like the mysterious Victor. Uh, Victor had actually come out of 5-1 with uh, 2 minutes and 55 seconds, I'm sorry, 3 minutes and 55 seconds of an actual videotape of an interrogation of, of one of the extraterrestrials there. Uh, which I think is still to this day completely genuine. Now you can just look it up on YouTube. Uh, there are so many things about that video that are actually indicators of the, of the genuineness of the video. Is that and, uh, um, these were, the being called Errol? No, it's just uh, if you just look up uh, the alien interview on the on the on YouTube, uh, you'll see it. And uh, we did a documentary about it. And actually, oddly enough, we we came across that because a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Broadstreet, worked for Rocket Video, and Jeff and I used to go out to Five One together. And Jeff calls me and says, hey, man, we got this piece of tape. You want to come in and look at it and kind of consult on this thing? And uh, 
uh, Victor approached Tom Coleman. Tom Coleman said, oh, Area 51. Jeff, didn't you used to go out to Area 51 with the uh, crazy Sean Morton guy? He said, yeah. And he goes, well, why don't you call him? Because we got a guy here that kind of sounds like kind of a live one if you want to pick this up that says he's got some video. And Fox wasn't interested because they'd just gotten burned on the whole, uh, that was Bob Keviet, and uh, that was the whole alien autopsy thing. And, uh, which once again, I turned Bob Keviet onto, and then Bob kind of snaked me on the whole deal. But, uh, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's a whole other story there about Volker Spielberg and, uh, Ray Santilli and how they actually came up with the tape and how they got the money for it and, you know, all that, which was, uh, there was always something kind of hinky that was going on with that. But anyway, so the course, throughout the course of this, I, I was just, I was developing these contacts of people who would call me and, and give me some very interesting inside information. Uh, about what was going on, and then I could act as a conduit for this information being released to the public uh, on things like coast to coast, as an example. Now, you know, I also got told as well that because I was, I was also, I mean, I was a spiritual guy first that was doing uh, predictions, like earthquake predictions. I predicted the the 1989 San Francisco earthquake. I took a bunch of people three weeks before that to Mount Shasta to see if we could do some meditations to to avert the quake. Uh, I predicted the Northridge quake 20 years ago. Uh, and this is in print, like months in advance, on the radio and in print, where I said this is what's going to happen at this particular place and what have you. So, you know, I was told specifically that uh, that because I was easy to discredit, because I was in the, quote, New Age movement or because I was some crazy psychic, uh, that that was the only thing that was keeping me alive. That that was the only thing that if I was a, that if I went more to the straight on, uh, journalistic aspect, and, you know, I did work for, I worked for hard copy for a couple of years as a, as a independent producer and, uh, and writer. Uh, I worked for Geraldo Rivera's Not Can Be Told. Uh, I was uh, one of the original creator producers on a, on a show called Strange Universe. Uh, which ran for three years on UPN, and I was very good friends with Bill Siegel, who was the head of UPN. He actually met me at a, a lecture and handed me a business card and said, I want you to come help us develop new shows for UPN, and uh, which I did. And uh, so when you're inside the media and you're working for hard copy and Strange Universe and, uh, you know, eventually, well, Sightings actually was the first one because uh, I was one of the uh, segment producers on, uh, uh, on the Area 51 piece for Sightings, and Sightings was the highest rated show in Fox's history up to that time. And it's a, it's a shame because Sightings... Only did 13 episodes, and then it was a it was the victim of a, a pissing contest between a bunch of lawyers, because the sightings people wanted them wanted Fox to order 24 episodes, and Fox said we only order 13 at a time, and they said well we'll go someplace else, and Fox said see you thanks for playing, but that's what then led to Chris Carter walking into Fox saying how about because we've seen the popularity of sightings why don't I do a show about two FBI agents that investigate all the stuff on sightings, and that's how X Files was born. So it's interesting how all this stuff relates back to me on a hilltop getting shot at by helicopters at Area 51, how that then goes into the public consciousness, makes the front page of the L.A. Times, leads to sightings, which then leads to X-Files, which then, you know, it's this whole kind of planetary unfoldment. So anyway, so as far as... It's all pivoting around your your life experience, your timeline. It's kind of a Forrest Gump sort of, you know, you're just in the middle of something. (laughs) Life happens to you. I know, it's weird. So, um... Uh, so, know, but also, I'm you know I'm I'm a fan of people. I, you know I'm, I'm you're very enthusiastic. Guy. You're very enthusiastic because I, 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 you know, I'm not cutting anybody down. I'm not trying to destroy anyone. I I legitimately was taking people like Bob Lazar and trying to champion what they were doing uh, to say this this is a new paradigm. This is something that's uh, uh, this is something that needs to be out there. So I, I've taken a lot of people and presented them to the uh, presented them to the public. It's always funny because I always forget that you're the guy that helped them. Uh, and eventually they turn on you because that's just <laughs> that's just eventually how, how it works. So with Sands of Time, the fascinating part about it was is that this was a fellow who for 20 years or so uh, uh, knew my father, was involved with TRW, was was very very much involved in the uh, in the shadow government and the development of uh, you know worked on the Montauk project, worked behind the scenes at Five One, uh, you know worked. Uh, basically, you know, fought the battles at Dulce and, and all this. And so, you know, he would call me on the phone and say, well, you're right on this and you're sort of off on that. And actually, it was kind of odd because the last time I heard from him was, uh, uh, was 2008. And he actually called, he was actually on. And so to relate this, and this, this relates more to the story. Uh, I get a call during the inauguration while Obama's being inaugurated. I'm sitting there watching the TV, watching Obama. And my phone rings 
and it's him, and he's actually on the podium, you know, with the group of people on the steps of the Capitol, and he's laughing his ass off, and I can hear him on the TV going, <laughs> I hear something laughing in the background. And what had happened was that Obama had just goofed up the, the oath of office, and I made him a bet, actually, because I wrote an article about this in my newsletter about a month before, saying that I that because Obama was not a citizen, and uh, because he was born in Kenya, and because his birth certificate is completely bogus, uh, I, I said, look, he, can, he still can be president of the United States because you take an oath as the commander-in-chief, you sign a bunch of papers later as the CEO of the corporation, and there are no citizenship requirements for the corporation, but to actually take the oath of the republic, and I said, he will find a way to screw up the oath. You have to say the oath exactly as it's written, and I think it's Article 6 of the Constitution, and he'll screw it up. And that's exactly what happened. And Roberts was the one that came and screwed up the oath, and he never said the oath correctly. Uh, he supposedly said it correctly in a private ceremony the next day. But, uh, you know, so Ted was on the, uh, he was actually on the stand up there laughing, calling me on the phone going, you son of a bitch, I can't believe you're totally right. He's screwing up the oath. I'm watching it happen. And uh, that was kind of funny. And that's the last I heard of him. And then, um, and then uh, the phone call stopped, and it wasn't like I could really contact him. And uh, and then I got this weird call from some some kind of spooky attorneys in Center City, where all the lawyers live. And I finally went down there to the office, and they said, uh, "Here's some journals." And this gentleman wanted you to have him. And I said, "Well, is he dead? Was there a funeral? Was there whatever?" And all they would tell me was that he had moved on. I'm like, "Moved? What does that mean? That, did he die? How did he die? Was it heart attack? <laughs> was he killed? Did somebody shoot him?" Well, he's moved on, and he wants you to have this, and we're part of his estate, and we're doing whatever it is we're doing. So it was a very weird sort of. You know, Doc Brown, Michael J. Fox kind of, you know, getting a letter in the middle of nowhere from Western Union sort of thing. It was very strange. And um, these journals, which I then novelized into uh, into Sands of Time, were his basically sort of the, the cliff notes, if you will, which I, I then filled in. And the reason I novelized them, one, because I wanted to make it a, an adventure that people could read, uh, two, just in case... Uh, you know, it, it allowed people the choice to say, okay, well, if you want to think that this is all real... Then that's fine. But if you want to think it's just a, you know, funky little science fiction story, then that's, that's good too. Uh, you know, either way it keeps me from getting shot. So that's, you know, so that's how Sounds of Time came about. And, uh, in the journals themselves, uh, and then my turning that into the, as you know, so it's novelized nonfiction, if you will, of the adventures of his life and all the specifics and all that. So that's how Sands of Time came about. And again, it's a, it's one man's journey as a man in black, as part of the shadow government, as a person who's been, on the inside of these projects, and it's confirmed so many so many things for so many people, and it gives the science, and it gives the whens and wheres, and it goes back to the uh, you know the first guy to travel in time as part of really a mistake back in uh, what 1960 as uh, May of 61, I think I think it was uh, uh, was just a you know an, ex- an experiment, and the you know the final fate of of Herr Doctor Hans Kammler. So anyway, we can get into the book now, or whatever it is you want to know. Yeah, the okay. Well, let's let's start. I mean, the the book uh, when I started reading it. Well, first of all, <laughs> my, I have a minor complaint. Right, oh, sure. my eyes are not very good. I'm oh, sorry, it's very small type. I know. The I know. type is quite small, and I I had to buy myself an extra bright uh, 360 lumen uh, LED lamp. Uh, and hold it very close to my face, and then I could read it quite well. Um, <laughs> well I, I, sent you, I, I sent you a PDF, which That's you could have blown up as big as you That's true. Um, but you've also done an audio book, haven't you? Yes, I have that too. So if you want me to send you that, that'd make it easier. Uh, uh, well, I, I've, just... I've read it. It's fine. I've read it. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, so the first thing I have to say is, like, it's a real... Um, it's it's a, a thriller novel thing it's exciting it's very exciting it's tense thank you it's yeah it's tense i mean the whole the whole 40 years is a tense atmosphere because it's like these people were placed in the you know they had in their lap placed one of the biggest mistakes of humanity ever um and uh you know no current <laughs> no current means of fixing it and you know, they didn't know at the time what what the implications were quite, but they, you know we found out soon enough. Um, but what it, ter- it turns out that the uh, the Nazi bell. So let's can we go back? I mean, sure. How far we can go back? I mean, we could go to well, Atlantis it, 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 and stuff like that. But 
uh, or even further but i'm interested in in um how did they get in touch with the nazis okay there's and uh, who were and they? there's there's well there's more there's also more to it i mean there's there's also part 2 to the book as well which i i'm just looking for a publisher if i could get a publisher to publish this one uh, cuz i've self published the book and if i get a publisher to publish this one then you know part 2 cuz there's still you know from about the year 1998 up until about 2008 2009 or so where where uh where ted moves on um and there's a the, the, the subsidiary story which I don't want to burden me with, but the bottom line is is that there's a there's a device which was called the Nazi Bell, and the Nazi Bell it was believed was to have been a, a crashed extraterrestrial spacecraft that was actually found in the Bavarian Black Forest, and the man who found it uh, at that time was uh, was Major Hans Hans Kammler. And this was about 34, about 34, 35 or so. And the experiments that they started doing with the Nazi bell is that the, the bell had the ability to create very, very intense gravitational fields. And they were able to replicate uh, and back, engine, back engineer much of the, uh, uh, much of what was going on with this. Uh, the challenge with it was is that it gave off this deadly, what they called purple radiation that was just killing everybody. And of course, uh, Hans Kammler was, and it, it's very strange that he disappears from history because you hear about you hear about Goebbels and you hear about uh, you know Spears and you hear about all the people around Hitler. Uh, uh, Hans Kammler was the guy that basically set up all the logistics for the concentration camps. Uh, he had 14 million people in Europe enslaved at one time. He was the uh, he was the man outside of Berlin. He was the he was the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 Gruppenführer, if yeah. you will. The Uber Gruppenführer, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he was, was and, the and he was top tease. Yeah, he was the second most powerful guy in, in Germany. And, uh, the reason for this was, was not only was he doing the concentration camps, but they also, based on this, this hyper technology, there were nine bases in Eastern Europe that were specifically building, uh, Hanabu and Vril, what they were called Hanabu and Vril type one, two, and three, uh, flying saucers that were based on everything from, uh, uh, BMW Messerschmitt, uh, uh, Mercury drive engines to uh, implosion engines that were a concept by a guy by the name of Victor von Schauberger, who was uh, who, who, by the way, designed most of the of the aircraft that we use today. He designed the uh, the SST, the uh, the 747, the supersonic transport, the YF-27, the uh, the F-117A, the stealth bomber. These are all from this from this Austrian uh, game warden who was using fish as uh, as as a design vehicle for aircraft and. Uh, Von Schauberger spent some time in the United States as well. He was actually brought here to Texas to try to use some of his implosion drive technology, and a bunch of these Texas millionaires kind of screwed him over, and the guy got sick and, uh, you know, went back to Austria and died. Uh, but Kammler vanishes in April of, of 1945, just completely disappears. And um, what happened with the Nazi bell, the long story short, because I'm not sure how, how much time we have for the interview, but um, what happened with the Nazi bell was is that it, it, it ripped open a gigantic hole in the time-space continuum. And... Um, the two worst events, the you know, most diabolical events, if you will, of the 20th century, not to be outdone, was the Americans and something that they did called Project Rainbow. And Project Rainbow, uh, the, the effect of Project Rainbow was uh, what people now know as the Philadelphia Experiment. Because not to be outdone, uh, what they did with the Philadelphia Experiment in the USS Eldridge is that they also tore open a gigantic hole in the space-time continuum. And not only did they do that, but they ripped a hole in the time-space continuum in 20-year increments. Uh, so this is the best way for me to describe it. Um, Earth was protected. There was a cloak, a shield, a fence around this planet. And the only way, the only, the only way I can explain it is that if if you go back to the sons of God and the Elohim and uh, the Nephilim and the Anunnaki and all these all these characters that that, that are described in in the Book of Enoch. Uh, which is an apocryphal book to the Bible that was actually discovered in, uh, there was something on ancient aliens saying that they found it in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls or something, which is a complete lie. We actually found it in, uh, uh, an Ethiopian Bible in 1777, one of the Bibles that was supposedly passed down from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. But, uh, um, in the book of Enoch, long story short, Enoch is known as, as a, as, as, as a pyramid builder, and he supposedly builds pyramids all across the world. Uh, not just the pyramids of Giza, but uh, we've actually found other pyramids as well, uh, uh, close to uh, Giza, under the sand. Uh, that is, we found one pyramid that's almost four times the size of the Great Pyramid, uh, about 100 miles away from the pyramid, under the sand. And um, 
uh, these angels, these 72 angels, of, of which 20 of which taught us horticulture and astronomy and astrology and, and metallurgy and whatever else, but these 72 angels fell, began to intermate with the human females, and they got kicked off the ship, these dark lords, if you will, by Yahweh. And uh, Yahweh then says, well, I'm kicking you off the boat, and now not only am I stranding you here, but because you've questioned my order, I'm, I'm, I'm putting up a big fence around the planet so that you can't get out and that none of your people can come in and help you. And Enoch goes crazy, and he does something called Enoch's Lament, which goes on for about seven chapters, that says that these dark lords will incarnate and control humanity down through time and be responsible for uh, Armageddon, basically. And, you know, theoretically, now the Dark Lords are people like Obama and the Bushes and the Kissingers and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the same characters uh, incarnating down through time. So there was a fence or a cloak that was put up around this planet to protect us. And what then happened was is that, is that the, the Nazi bell ripped open a gigantic hole in the space-time continuum, which then created an invasion of, of this planet from another dimension. And uh, then the USS Eldridge comes along. And here's the weird thing about the Eldridge, is that you had the greatest minds on Earth. I mean, we're talking about the Manhattan Project being the Tinker Toys, where they're developing the atomic bomb. The real brains were Tesla, Einstein, John Van Neumann, uh, Vannevar Bush, you know, guys who founded Raytheon and, you know, TRW and Northrop Grumman and all these other, all these, you know, major, major aerospace companies were all working on invisibility and teleportation, basically. And... Um, uh, Tesla, who, who was supposed to have died in January of 1943, although the information is, is that his death was then faked and a doppelganger was put in his place, and it's the doppelganger who died. And because Tesla was actually then seen many years later after his supposed death was interviewed uh, uh, well into the 50s and possibly into the early 60s, which would have made him well over 100 years old, which is kind of interesting. But um, anyway, the USS Eldridge is tricked up with... Uh, with these degaussing coils to see if they can make it invisible to uh, to radar. And there's a group above the smartest guys on the planet, which is called the K Group. And the K Group was insisting that the USS Eldridge and this experiment for Project Rainbow be performed on a specific day at a specific time, which was August 12th of 1943. Now, strangely enough, as it was explained to me, that particular date was a biologic, spiritual, and physical low point in the biorhythmic plan or the patterns of the planet, which are all actually charted by the Chinese I Ching. And this was a 60-year low point, and by triggering the Eldridge at that point, it's almost as if time and space crumpled, like a, uh, like crumpling up a piece of paper and then driving a pencil through it and then uncrumpling the paper. And then what happened was is that when you when the Eldridge disappeared or vanished, or they turned on these coils, that the Eldridge then not only ripped this other gigantic hole in the space-time continuum, but it did it all the way down through time. And it did it in 20-year increments, almost as if you fold up a blanket, uh, again, or a piece of paper, an accordion, and then jab a pencil through it. And it got to the end of its tether in uh, on August 12th of 2003, and then snapped all the way back to, uh, uh, to 1943 or so. Now, actually, with that information in hand, I wrote an article months in advance, saying that if this is true and Project Rainbow happened and the Eldridge is a reality, then we need to look for a massive electromagnetic disturbance and a, and a huge anomaly occurring on the East Coast uh, in, this, in this time frame, in the August 12th, 13th time frame. And lo and behold, uh, it was August 13th of 2003, the entire East Coast blacked out. And New York was without power for three days. Most of the East Coast was without power for 28 days or so. And they claimed it was a power surge that occurred, quote, in the blink of an eye, is what they called it, that then overloaded all the power grids, which was the Eldridge actually uh, snapping back through time. So now we're dealing with these holes in the time-space continuum, uh, an invasion from a lot of different quadrants, if you will, and uh, so now we're moving down through time, and, at the, and now it gets even more interesting because then now we have the Montauk Project. And the Montauk Project in the early 60s is, is a, uh, of, uh, this device that they called the Beast was sort of a recreation of the Nazi bell. It was this gigantic kind of three-ringed uh, device that allowed us to uh, teleport things from place to place. And what we were doing is we were studying time. And we were studying time dilation. And in the heart, and, and, and the biggest, best place to study that dilation is in the heart of nuclear explosions. Because in any type, in any explosion, actually, whether it's a, a nuclear, hydrogen, cobalt, whatever, any kind of explosion, dynamite, any kind of explosion, there's a time dilation that occurs at the exact heart of the explosion. 
So what we were doing is we were taking these probes at the time, and we were jumping probes into the heart of Russian nuclear tests to pick up telemetry and do all kinds of things to study uh, not only how you open these holes in the time-space continuum, but how you close them as well. So in this one particular experiment, which Ted Humphrey was the character in my book uh, was was the boss of, uh, he thought of a way to take the probes, jump them to the moon, where they would be super cooled at, I don't know, 250 degrees below zero, then jump them into the heart of the experiment, uh, where they could last longer, then jump them back to the moon where they would cool them off, and then bring them back to the laboratory. Well, the minute we began teleporting objects outside of the morphogenic field of Earth, uh, a massive time dilation began to occur. And this is when, and the weird thing is, is that when you travel through time, here's the caveat to it. When one of our, our men got sucked into this time vortex, this time dilation field, you actually go through the astral plane. And a, there's all kinds of weird, nasty stuff that lives in the astral plane. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it's basically the Bardo, if you will. It's the, the best description of it is the Tibetan Bardo. That, that when you move through the Bardo, you're moving through, uh, the realm of, pre- of pretas or hungry ghosts, if you will. And our guy came out the other end, uh, thank goodness, uh, covered with this sort of ectoplasmic slime, uh, completely terrified, uh, you know, sh- shaken like a skinny puppy. And, um, but he was the first guy to actually then travel through time. And as, and as we moved along, primarily at Area 51, not only were we, at 5-1, not only were we trying to reverse engineer the, the saucers, but th- and this is what people don't realize that we weren't that concerned about the power aspect of the saucers. We were fascinated by the fact that the saucers had the ability to dilate time. That they could actually, when you got in the saucer, uh, what what to you relatively felt like about two minutes, where they jump in the saucer and they'd hover it against the ceiling and bring it back down, would be like 22 hours in real time because they had the ability uh, to dilate the time stream and and uh, and time travel was the biggest. Uh, and actually not only time travel, but the ability to actually then turn it into what they called a, a man-portable device uh, known as a time runner uh, as a backpack or maybe a, a, a something that you could put in a car uh, or ultimately if they could conquer the power aspects of it, something that would be like a uh, like a pager or a, a cell phone or something, and, and that could actually uh, create a field that could allow you to bounce back and forth in time. So that's what Sands of Time is about. It's it, it's It's the... It, it also describes to a secret society, if you will, of technocrats that have access to uh, hyper advanced super technology that are creating a gigantic planetary defense grid. And I had some arguments as well with, with, with Ted about this stuff, uh, because their claim was, and he was telling me that, that right around 2008 or so, that trillions of dollars were going to disappear, that we were behind schedule, that they were just going to loot it out of the, uh, out of the financial markets, and it was going to cause this big... I mean, he was telling me this in 2006, like, you know, years in advance. Uh, and that the, what they were building was they were building a gigantic planetary and actually ultimately interplanetary defense grid because there was something big and very nasty and apparently a, a an armada that was heading this way and that it was going to get here sometime in the beginning of the, uh, uh, the, beginning of the next decade, in the 2020s or so. And... Um, and he said, if you don't believe me, it's, it's, it's all the bad parts of the book of Revelation. He says, look at the book of Revelation, and, and you're looking at what we're dealing with. And it's pretty interesting, because if you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about a war in heaven, and that the archangel Michael is, uh, you know, who are the Pleiadians, by the way, uh, have, a, have a fight with the, with, with the red dragon, is what it's called, which is apparently the Sarmata that's coming from the, the, uh, the constellation of Alpha Draconis, Apparently the capital planet is Thuban, which used to be the North Star here. And they'd had beings from Thuban uh, on Earth back in the Egyptian days where they were called Set or Seth or Sutek of the serpent gods. And uh, Michael is, in the, in the Revelation account, Michael is injured. He's wounded by the, by the dragon. Uh, he casts the dragon down to Earth. The dragon is then trapped on Earth somehow. And then we we Earth people have to then fight the dragon. Well, it got even stranger because I was very good friends with uh, with Al Bielik and Duncan Cameron and uh, Preston Nichols, and you know Al and I were very very close. And I was and up until his death, I was sending him money and supporting him and trying to do anything I could for him. And Al claims to have been one of the people that was that actually that he and his brother Duncan 
had thrown the switches on the USS Eldridge. And when the Eldridge was screaming through time, that he and his brother jumped off the uh, the boat. And his claim was that he spent a period of time in the year 2139, and that they were there for about six months or so. And he said all about how this that we were going to have this big war with these Alpha Draconians and what was going on. So everything that Ted was telling me was now reinforcing everything that Al had told me years before. And, of course, my response to this was also, well, it just sounds like another scam. It just sounds like... And the same thing was said about the Russians, and they were all big and bad until they collapsed, and now it's the Chinese, and they're all big and bad. And, you know, it just sounds like a like another enemy that's being used as an excuse to spend trillions of dollars. Um, it's just also strange, too, the, the correlating information of it is, is that I was one of the first uh, uh, first people to jump on the, uh, on the story of Gary McKinnon. And Gary McKinnon, using some Hungarian software, managed to hack into the defense databases of the, uh, of, of the Defense Department uh, and downloaded a whole ton of information for which the U.S. government wanted him deported from the U.K. And finally, by the way, the British government stood up on its hind legs and said no. And they wanted him, they wanted him to be taken to the United States as an enemy combatant. Uh, simply because he just downloaded some stuff, uh, you know, from these military databases. Yeah. He, he, he downloaded some uh, manifests, just like just the list of people who go onto ships. Um, but yeah, it was no, just at the top, that, wasn't it? It was a very subtle yeah. thing. Not just that. He downloaded an entire Starfleet. I mean, he downloaded USS Enterprise, Constellation, Republic, uh, Lexington, I mean, it was literally like it was like it was like a Star Trek site. It was it was it was extraterrestrial ships, craft, personnel, bases. You know, the whole thing. You know, the entire interplanetary defense grid. Now, the only other thing, the one other thing that we saw out at five one in our time out there uh, with my myself, my friend John Hadley, who was who was murdered actually uh, later on. I've had all these friends: Danny Casalero, John Hadley. Jim Keith, all these friends of mine who've been, you know, you know, Jim Keith died under weird circumstances, but uh, Danny was flat out murdered and John was flat out murdered. Uh, but we saw a we saw a shuttlecraft fly over our heads while we were out there in the desert, and this thing was coming in uh, doing Mach 25, and this thing was 1,600 feet from tip to tail. Uh, it looked like a huge uh, wedge, like a like a door wedge uh, that was uh, it was black on the bottom, uh, white or silverish on the top. Had a blunt shovel nose on it, and this was a gigantic shuttle. Years later, we saw this in ninety summer of ninety two, I think it was. And uh, years later, uh, we saw the same thing on the Discovery Channel. He calls me on the phone and says, "Turn on Discovery Channel," and they were talking about the uh, the uh, a shuttle called the X sixty six. And they said this thing was going to be flying in like 2035 or something, and it was exactly what we saw out there. And it was coming in from space. I actually asked Ted about this and said, what was the deal? And he said the thing wasn't calibrated correctly. And so when it was actually flying in, it was it was flying into 51 for repairs, uh, and it was creating these gigantic sonic booms as it was coming in, uh, which they were calling skyquakes because it was creating these like 3.5 earthquakes on the ground as it was coming in as the shockwave was rolling off the bottom of this thing and up to the top of it. And, they were, and it was on the news. It was on Channel 7 where they said, you know, these were two objects coming in, but it was actually one giant object that flew right over our heads. And this is the only time that the Wackenhut security people ever chased us. They actually chased us all the way back to Rachel, and we, you know, we hid in one of the mobile homes, and they, you know, they gave up looking for us. But uh, but in the process of, of Sands of Time, we go through, you know, Montauk, the first time travel experiments, then we go through Area 51, uh, then we get in, we get involved with the the Dulce Archuleta Mesa, and, uh, the, you know, what, what eventually turned into a war, with uh, with these extraterrestrials uh, there at the Dulce Mesa. Yeah. Now here's one of the things um, we're we're coming up to the um, to the break in a in a few minutes or in a less than a minute I think. Um, but there's this this one character um, who turns out to be, a, you know, you're able to converse with this being called Lord Tugi. Tugi, yeah, Lord Tugi. Tugi. Um, yeah. Oh, so hold that thought. We're gonna we're gonna talk about Tugi. Uh, on, okay. on the end of the uh, on the in the second hour, thank you very much, Sean David Morton. Uh, stay tuned for more strangeness on the journey. <laughs> the door of the TARDIS opens in an <laughs> underground tunnel somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere under the Nevada desert. 
Where are we? asked the assistant who happens to be hot and red-headed. I think we're at Area 51, said the doctor. <laughs> Somebody's been messing about with time. And they're very, very naughty boys. <laughs> Lord Tukey was yes. was a resident of this place. Now, um, could you give us a bit of the chronology of Dulcie? This, Dulcie is, is like... <sighs> Some an, an underground base in the mountain that they thought they'd just make an underground base in. Oh, that looks like a nice place for an underground base, and it turned out to be like a, a ant's nest of, of extraterrestrials uh, who seemed to have some representative. I, I think he was probably an ambassador um, who they called Lord Tugi. Um, so, do you, do you want to give, give us a, a bit of background? And I, you know, I, I want to, I want to be able to see Lord Tugi. What, do you, what do you look like? Is he tall? Is he maggot? Or you know, <laughs> could you could you draw us some pictures for for us? Uh, very, uh, you know, he was uh, very handsome, high forehead, uh, a blonde, uh, blue eyed, uh, about uh, I think about six uh, two or so. Uh, excellent physique, uh, a bit of a ruddy complexion as. Uh, as he was described, basically, just looked like your standard uh, uh, tall, what they would call a you know a tall white or a, a, a Pleiadian, if you will. Uh, Dulce has been very interesting because I, I I put a lot of research into Dulce before before anything happened with Sands of Time or before the book or or anything, and, and it's been a uh, it's it, there's been a lot of controversy around the Dulce. It's called the Dulce Archuleta Mesa. And it's in northern New Mexico, in the uh, on an Apache Hickoria Indian reservation, near the town of Farmington, where uh, where Demi Moore is from, oddly enough. And in northern New Mexico, uh, the uh, here's here's what was kind of strange. There was a uh, a guy by the name of Bob Moore, who was a, a quote UFO investigator. I guess you could say he wrote uh, he was financed by Charles Burletts. And they wrote some books about the Bermuda Triangle. Charles Burlett's the uh, the guy, the the language king. And uh, they wrote a book about the Bermuda Triangle. And uh, Bob Moore's a he's a pretty disgusting guy. And uh, uh, Moore claimed that he made up this entire mythology about the Dulce Mesa, and then released it into the UFO community uh, just to show people how stupid UFO researchers were. And that he was, a, and he admitted that he said, "I'm an agent for the government." Uh, I've been working as a disinformation agent, and I've just made up this whole thing about Dulce. Well, we took the challenge of this because I had interviewed people that, I mean, I knew people personally that had actually been inside the Dulce Mesa. Uh, Wendell Stevens had done a lot of a lot of stuff with the Dulce Mesa as well. So let me give you the progression of the Dulce Mesa. There was a there's a massive series of natural cave structures that run the length of New Mexico and Colorado. These gigantic caves, beginning with Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico, going all the way up underneath you know, Colorado, uh, all the way up into Canada, were created when the uh, uh, when the North American platelet then crashed into. And there's one area in Colorado where you actually have the uh, uh, the Sierra Nevadas, the Rocky Mountains, and the uh, the uh, f- uh, Flatiron Mountains all come together. And you have three mountain ranges that are that are uh, literally three different colors. Uh, right outside of the, the city of Golden, Colorado. And it created a huge series of natural caves underneath the mountains of the Rockies and the Sierras. Now, in uh, the Apache Indians claimed that they fought the sky people, or the ant people, as they also called them, underground uh, at, at that time, and that, and that there are large methane deposits underneath this area as well. Well, apparently these extraterrestrials were... And, and, and again, they may or may not be extraterrestrials. That's the kind of interesting thing about it. There does seem to be uh, a race of reptilians that live underground, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second, uh, that do live underground that seem to be assisted in their evolution or their development by an extraterrestrial race of reptilians as well. So supposedly the Apaches, well, the Apaches do have these legends about them fighting the ant people in the various caves underground. In 1955, a pair of engineers were tasked with hollowing out the already existing cave system of the Dulce Mesa to turn it into a, 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 an, an atomic repository for nuclear waste. The governor of New Mexico said, no, we've got enough nuclear junk here anyway, and we're not going to allow you to import any more nuclear garbage into New Mexico. So supposedly the base was abandoned. 
the U.S. government still decided they were going to use it. And through the late 60s and most of the 70s, a facility was manufactured there that was uh, seven levels. Each one of the levels were color-coded, strangely enough, going from uh, uh, color-coded with the chakra points of the body, going from violet to uh, uh, to red. And uh, no numbers, actually, interesting enough, on the uh, uh, because apparently these ETs they were dealing with are colorblind. So uh, there were no numbers as to, as to level one, two, three, or four. It was all just color-coded. And the story goes is that the top of the, the Dulce Mesa, which was a, a big dome, became a, a way for them to come and go. There were helicopters and jets and all kinds of things that were coming and going out of it. But that below level four, that there was a genetic research facility that was there, and um, and they were doing genetic experimentations. This is also the place where we believe that they first, a, a scientist by the name of Henry Monteith, was the first fellow, and this was this was from a video from 1977, where he actually crossbred uh, plant DNA or plant RNA, the cytoplasmic plant RNA, with uh, uh, with mammals, with, uh, with some laboratory hamsters actually. And there was a piece of video that I saw at uh, uh, Jim Delatoso's house that actually had, was about 19 minutes long or so that actually had uh, 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 Dr. Monteith on the video. Where it looks as though he cannibalized the camera from a, a corner of the uh, uh, of the facility and uh, set it up in his laboratory and s- said, "Hello, uh, I am. Uh, we are, are looking for funding, and uh, we believe that we have come up with a, a laser tweezer process by which we can actually combine the, uh, the, uh, the 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 RNA of plants with the DNA of animals." And he stitches these together, and he grows this plant in his laboratory. Over the course of this kind of time lapse photography video, grows this plant in his laboratory that looks like an aloe vera plant, but has like these little buds on them that uh, that are like with faces, like little teeth and eyes of of hamsters. And uh, and remember, I've been talking about this for 20 years, okay, going on 20, maybe 30 years now. Be, you know, I started talking about this in 19. 19- 89, I think it was, when, you know, people were just saying, you know, you're just completely out of your hammock, and, and if you look at what's happening today, Monteith successfully managed to cr- cross uh, plant and animal DNA. And he grows this plant in his laboratory, and it's got little feet on it, and it's got sort of a golden fur, and then he says, and, and I'm looking for $55,000 from the public sector, uh, to complete this experiment. Now, for as weird as that sounds, the video, was taken for, and, and by the way, then the video cuts off, and then what you see was what was on the video before, and it's a security camera that's simply moving back and forth, and what you now see are you see a series of, I don't know if I can call them, uh, you see a vat, uh, there's a control dais, and you see a, an oblong vat that then has, looks like a big hot tub that then has a tube going into it, all along one wall, you see what look like are a series of, of, of bubble-shaped aquariums along the wall. Then you see a, a, a track in which a, uh, like a little monorail car goes through it with a, with a, uh, with a low guard rail fence. And then you see these black, uh, uh, these, well, they look like suction cups kind of actually coming out of the ceiling, but they've got sacks coming out of them that are actually growing these, what look like alien beings in the sacks, uh, of which they're probably about three to four feet high or so. And then you, it switches to something else where you see another one of these weird little, you know, tiny creatures moving across. You can't quite see it. Uh, it's kind of just, you know, it looks like a gnome actually moving across the, the shot of the camera. And that's pretty much it. It then cuts off. Well, the very next year, in 1978, Monsanto actually came up with the, with the process, uh, patented the process of combining uh, rodent and 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 plant DNA, and this pro and, and now it's what we call this is what, this is what I've been talking about since '89. It's now what we call gen, you know genetically modified uh, food. This is all the GMO stuff that everyone's talking about because they're actually crossbreeding rat genes with tobacco to make uh, make it so tobacco burns longer and uh, it doesn't freeze. Uh, they're mixing it with tomatoes so that the tomatoes are larger and have a longer shelf life. Uh, so all of this stuff is now uh, not only in the realm of possibility, but is is now every day. Now we're having to pass laws against it, where in the UFO community we've been talking about this for forever. So what happened to Dulce was is that we pretty much just left levels one through four at the bottom of the base, and we gave them to these this extraterrestrial base uh, uh, group that we were working with. Uh, there was a minor skirmish between some guards and these ETs in which a couple of people were killed, 
uh, through some sort of misunderstanding uh, that you read about, as you saw about in the book, uh, that happened about 78 or so. And then it got to the point of where uh, when we were building the underground train system underneath, and, and, and we have a... We have a massively advanced hypersonic uh, porcelain train system that runs underneath the United States. That was all part of uh, it was all part of Eisenhower's uh, Autobahn project. It all started it all started back in the uh, sorry it all it all started back in the fifties. And um, turn it off. Uh, it all started back in the fifties. But this it's called the Red Line and the Blue Line, and it goes all the way across the United States. And they travel at about anywhere between seven fifty and about eight hundred forty miles an hour. Uh, they're porcelain, so that you don't have a buildup of electromagnetic energies. And um, it's a beautiful subway system that runs underneath the United States and it allows you to high officials to travel. Uh, supposedly, if there was a nuclear war with the Russians or the uh, uh, the Russians or the or the Chinese, uh, you would be protected from it, or you could move underground without actually being seen by anybody extraterrestrial. So the bottom line was is that we were told by uh, Reagan finally, who got on board with this whole thing. He was one of the last. Well, him and Bush were the last ones to really know the whole thing. And Reagan said, go in and clean it out, because as we were completing uh, this track uh, of what, what was known as the Dulce Station, uh, we ran into a cave, and in this cave there were tens of thousands of skeletons. And we were finding that, and a deal was struck, this goes back to, uh, uh, to Eisenhower, uh, in, in February of 1953, Eisenhower is is playing golf, supposedly has a dental problem, and is whisked off. He's in Palm Springs, and he's whisked off to Murak Air Force Base, which is now Edwards Air Force Base. And he has a meeting with a group of extraterrestrials, and this was very well documented by uh, Gerald Light, by by Bishop McIntyre, who was the Archbishop of Los Angeles. There were you know, all kinds of sworn statements about this meeting, where he meets with these group of beings that, that, were, that are tall whites, that they called the Ethereans. They didn't have a name. They didn't say where they came from. They had they called them Ethereans because they had these little uh, belt buckle devices. They could switch and they could turn invisible if they wanted to. And um, uh, they made Eisenhower an offer. They said, "Look, we will give you technology. We will help you evolve. We will help you turn out into a peaceful people if you are willing to give up your atomic weapons." And um, Eisenhower said, uh, "Well, first off." His suspicion was, for all I know, you could be very advanced Germans, because I've seen what the German technology looks like, number one. Number two, if you're afraid of nuclear weapons, then that might be the only thing we might have to defend our planet from you. And uh, no, we're not going to give up our nuclear weapons, and you know, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, they warned him at that time. They said, by the way, we came through this rip in the time-space continuum. So did the Greys, and these Greys are waiting uh, they've got a mothership, uh, the other side of the moon, and they're going to be contacting you pretty soon, and we're warning you, they're very bad news. So, by November of 1953, they contact Eisenhower as well. They say, we don't, we don't care about your nuclear weapons, blow yourselves up, we don't care what you do. Uh, we'll give you tech, but we want genetic material. We want the right to be able to abduct people, because we're at the end of a genetic breeding cycle, if you will, and we want sperm and eggs to be able to kind of refresh our species. And we'll pick people up, we'll take the samples, we'll wipe their minds, put them back where they came from, and no harm, no foul. And Eisenhower's like, yeah, I'm good with that. In exchange, we got basically like, you know, glass beads and, you know, mirrors and, uh, you know, complete junk. So, sure. But, can, I, can, yeah. I, can I pause you there? So, sure. somewhere in the infinite probability universe, there is a universe, or maybe several, where Eisenhower didn't sell us down the river. <laughs> That's the point, I, isn't I, it? I, That's the yeah, moment. I don't that, know. that was the moment where he could have said, "Okay, Ethereans, you sound like good guys, um, and I don't like the look of these little grey fellows." But he he didn't have the I don't know. He he was uh, he he was a Baptist, wasn't he? He was, he was very judgmental. Well, he was, and, and again, you you have to you understand that he's, he you know we just fought a war against the Germans and the Japanese. We oh and and. Please remember that we got German technology for the Germans were flying around in flying saucers, and they looked exactly like the flying saucers of George Adamski. And, and we know that not only did Hitler escape, but there was a group of these people with this very advanced technology that were developing it in Brazil. And um, that's a whole other story. But supposedly, as the Germans moved off the planet, they they actually came into contact with the Pleiadians, and there's a whole big base down in the Matt Morrill's plane down there. So let's get to Lord Toogie now at, 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 at Area 51, at uh, please, Dulce. Please, Dulce. Yeah. So, here's Lord, so here's Lord Toogie. So what happens with Lord Toogie is, is that, and this is, this is how it's been explained to me, the Earth is 
in a contested area of space. That the contest, the, the contest is between these two great empires. One is a reptilian based empire that is supposedly run by the Alpha Draconians. And, and by the way, I, you know, this information, I, you know, I'm not an abductee, I'm not a contactee, I'm not, I'm not claiming authority on this. Uh, this comes from people that I believe have high enough level information and also people that have had direct extraterrestrial contact like Billy Meyer, like, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Audrey Ain, uh, who was very famous for the, uh, well, we tried to make him famous. He didn't want to give us rights to anything, but he was actually riding on Palladian craft in, uh, in Miami. Uh, there's known as the Miami contacts. He lives in Germany now. But, uh, as it was explained to me that the earth is in this contested area of space, that you had a reptilian, you had the reptilians who were here for many, many millions of years that were in the process of evolving a reptilian based life form on the planet, uh, that was then destroyed 60, 65 million years ago. Uh, quite possibly not by a comet like we think, but conceivably by the Pleiadian Empire. And this is how uh, supposedly all the humanoid races of this universe came through a collapsing other universe uh, through the Ring Nebula in the constellation of Lyra. And the Lyrans were these these blonde giants who, like Vikings, sort of stormed across the, the solar system uh, in a constant war uh, with a race of Asiatics that, for lack of a better term, we would probably call like the Japanese, uh, who were actually from a system called Nissan, strangely enough. Um, so they wore brilliant. No, it's actually called Nissan after the car. Well, for example, Mazda is their god of thunder. Yeah, well, uh, Subaru means Pleiades. Yeah, Nissan is the is is the constellation or universe where they're all from. Um, you know, so you've got this, and, you know, the, and you've also got the Chinese who claim to be celestials, the children of heaven who came here inside the moon after Epsilon Aridni went nova, but that's a whole other story. So, um, so you've got this, this these warring factions where you've got the reptilian faction on the one hand. And the Palladian faction on the other, where the reptilian faction wants to grow a, a reptilian evolutionary stream, and you've got the Palladians and Lyrans, and on the other hand, who want to make sure that the, that the mammalian humanoid stream pr- processes. So, both of these species are represented here. The, the dragons, if you will, or the, the reptilians went underground, and they evolved underground in these giant, uh, uh, velts, if you will, these, uh, uh, these, the, earth, the earth isn't hollow, but it looks like Swiss cheese. And there's these, um, uh, when I lived in Nepal, the, uh, the monks in the monastery there called them the Nagasarachi, or the royal serpent men. And they said that they've developed, uh, over the course of millions of years, and they've, they're, they're bipedal, and they've, they're, they're, you know, they look humanoid, if you will, tails, big eyes, you know, reptilians. They kind of look like the Geico salesman. And, uh, except much bigger. And that they are, uh, uh, that they live underneath the Himalayas, that there's a huge belt in the Himalayas, which was, by the way, proved by the Chinese when they were doing all kinds of atomic testing. They, they call it Agharta Major, and Agharta Minor is underneath the Gobi Desert. Meanwhile, so they blow up the reptilians. Uh, the reptilians go underground, and they help the mammals. So the mammals live on the surface, supposedly being helped by the Palladians, uh, or the various other humanoid races that represent the different races, supposedly the uh, the red races come from Sirius A, the black races come from Sirius B, uh, the Asiatic races come from Epsilon Aridni, which went supernova about 80,000 years ago, uh, the Caucasioid races are from, uh, are primarily from the Pleiades, and so there's a conflict now between these two great empires where we're here. Now, the Watchers, or the Guardians, if you will, um, they have rules as to who takes over planets, and, um, their rules have to do with consciousness and whether or not the consciousness of the people of Earth rises or ascends allows them to come in and help and assist with that evolution of consciousness. But if it continues to devolve and decay into chaos, then they're more than willing to let the Alpha Draconian Empire come in and basically wipe everybody out and kind of start over. Now, where Lord Tugi comes into this, as I understand it from the royal houses of Edacta, uh, is that is that he was a casualty. There are certain planets where these reptilians have actually taken over uh, and enslaved planets of humanoids. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Tugi, as one of the royal houses, was given as a as a hostage, if you will, to intercommunicate in, in order for his planet to not be destroyed. Uh, he had to work for the greys and the reptilians, if you will, to then intercommunicate with the uh, uh, with the human beings on Earth. And, uh, and again, that's when they began to figure out that Tugi was not the guy in charge as to, you know, the hive 
that he barely, not even, not controlled really, but it was his job to then interact, uh, with humanity. And of course then after the, uh, after we decided to clear out the Dulce Mesa, and, uh, you know, and to this day we don't really even know how we won the battle. It was, uh, it was his planet that was, you know, completely wiped out. It was totally destroyed, just turned into ashes. Uh, because he was the one that was, that was given as a, as a, as a ransom, if you will, uh, for him to work with the, with the greys on this planet as a, as a liaison with the, with the human beings. And, and what they were doing, and I'm not sure, it's, it's kind of hard to catch in the book, but what they were actually doing is that the humans that they were abducting, they were boiling down to genetic material, in essence making, uh, you know, MREs, meals ready to eat, or a cup of soups, if you will, out of human beings, and actually storing them for uh, as a food supply for uh, for the coming in invasion and that's when we found all the bones all these boiled bones underneath uh, underneath dulce was when the final decision the command decisions basically came down that uh, that's enough of these guys we're going to kick them all out of here now here's an anomaly to this as well because supposedly the dulce war where we blew this place up and um and kicked them all out occurred sometime, and, the, and the, the timeline is not really that clear, but it's, it occurred sometime around 1985, 86 or so. When I was there with a research team in December of 1989, which included Jim Delatoso and Dr. Fred Bell and Paul Shepard and, uh, uh, you know, our film crew, and uh, a woman by the name of Krista Tilton, who had actually been abducted and actually taken inside the Mesa, and she was taken up in a helicopter, by a Japanese crew, and she showed us the entrances and all the roads and, you know, all the stuff that's up on top of the Mesa that shouldn't be there. And she also described people in glass tubes, and she met a uh, uh, a bearded intelligence officer who she later identified as a guy named uh, Richard Doty, Captain Richard Doty. Uh, so she gave us, uh, you know, some insights into what was going on in the base. Now, Jim Delatoso came up with a rather brilliant way of sounding the facility, and coming up with what was known as data tabling, which has now been uh, perfected for oil research and, and other things, where we actually did these sonic slices of, uh, uh, of, of ground-penetrating radar, and then he worked them through 75 hours of Cray supercomputer time, which then put all the slices of bread together and created a, 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 a visual of what was there. And we absolutely proved. Not only was there a big dome, and it went down about... Uh, uh, seven to ten levels or so, and there were jet tubes that were still operating. There was vibrational jet tubes still operating, coming and going from the facility. But there was a nuclear pile that was actually operating in about 440 cycles at the heart of Dulce. And this was 89. Um, the weird thing that we did, though, is that the sounds that we used to pound the mountain were the sounds of a Pleiadian beam ship from the Billy Meyer case, which Jim had already done a bunch of sonic analysis on. So the kind of funky trick was is that if there were still greys or uh, these reptilian entities in the uh, in the mesa, uh, the sound of a Palladian beam ship overloads their circuits. It basically gives them a hell of a headache. We've been able to clear entire haunted house spaces with the uh, uh, with the Palladian beam ship sound. So and we left these things connected to car batteries where they continued to pound it for a couple of weeks or so. Uh, three weeks after we were there, a huge green fireball was seen rising out of the mesa by the uh, uh, by the Apaches, and then it shot across the western United States and was reported, again, in the L.A. Times, and then a few days later, another green fireball came out of the Mesa and shot the other way, shot uh, shot east. And I haven't heard of that much activity there. And, and remember also that Dulce was the beginning of uh, Linda Moulton Howe's career because that was where all the uh, original cattle mutilations began, where the cattle were being exsanguinated and uh, you know chopped apart with laser beams and all this. So the bottom line with Tugi was is that he was a he was a captive Nordic uh, on a planet that had been conquered by the uh, by the reptilians that was in essence sent by them to Earth to act as a liaison between the human beings and uh, whatever they were doing uh, underground with his with his entire planet really being held hostage. So um, you know in the end when he uh, I don't want to wreck it for people that want to buy Sands of Time, but uh, at the end of the battle, uh, you know, you, you do find out that his that his planet has been basically destroyed and turned into a cinder so, uh, so, while he tries to take his revenge. So essentially, he's Malari. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, I mean, if anybody's exactly seen right, yeah. Babylon Five, uh, Malari yes. is the Centauri. They're the last of their kind. They're incredibly proud and very royal oriented and 
Born to the purple. Uh, <laughs> Beer. <laughs> Mystic. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I, I love it. Anyway. Those, those are the... Those are the guys that look like like uh, like Giorgio on uh, on uh, on uh, Ancient Aliens. It's like you know, a, the guy with the crazy, yeah, crazy yeah. hair. Yeah, yeah. He's aliens. like an uh, an entire planet of Napoleons. Yes, yeah. sort of like that. So that's the character of of them. They're very uh, of 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 the Tugi race. Uh, the, right. So, yes. So that's interesting. So he was, yeah, and again, very much like Malari, because Malari was pushed out of his people as well, because he was such a right. bumbling idiot. They wanted to get rid of him. Well, let's put let's put him over there with the other with the other weirdos, the other aliens, you know. Anyway, um, so there's there's Tugi. That was that was fascinating because um, I was wondering whether he was like a reptilian or or anything like that. So he, in the end, he turned out that um, he had some key information. Everybody has this little piece of the of, of the puzzle as it goes through the book. I mean, it's almost like somebody was writing it as a, as a novel. This guy's life. Well, uh, it's also one of the more interesting characters you didn't mention. I think that that I think is still one of the most intriguing characters in the book, and there's still more about him in the the rest of the material that I have uh, is Mr. Atkins, and uh, uh, Mr. Atkins is is one of the watchers, is one of the guardians, if you will. And Mr. Atkins, if you remember the meeting with uh, with with Ted at the uh, at the desert resort, where uh, he, and it's 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 funny the way they pass information because you have people further down the line in the time stream, and they're allowed to pass information down the time stream, if you will, if that person is going to develop, if, if they're going to develop something anyway, they they apparently have uh, permission. To if you you know he hands he hands Ted some equations that says basically these are from your father so I'm not really breaking any rules here uh, because you're going to discover this anyway and all we're doing is kind of helping you discover it of course they're helping him discover it so uh, <laughs> whether or not it's the unified field theory or whether or not it's more you know more time travel stuff uh, and it's and, and actually the only complaint about the book has been is there's not you know, I called it Sands of Time, and it is about the development of time travel, and there really isn't that much time travel in it. It's 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 people passing information down through time, and it has more to do with uh, more to do with the defense of Earth, and and, uh, and the fascinating part is that you get to you get this peek behind the shadow government and the whole shadow world of uh, of places like Five One and Dulce, and and it's changed a lot of people's opinion. Because you know, I've pointed out that, and now even Cliff High is starting to believe me. Who was, you know, it was one of my, and Cliff is always like, "Oh, you're just crazy," because <laughs> I, you know, because I, I, I've always had this opinion that there's there are good people in the government and bad people in the government. That's like saying, you know, not everybody in the Pentagon is is some evil scumbag or baby killer. And it really does seem to me, having been in the prophecy business and having seen certain aspects of the future, that things have been changed, and that you do have you have autocrats and technocrats, and the autocrats I think are are very happily building us a cage. However, that's beginning to shift and change as people are fighting back, as now the world is really turning. Um, you know, you had China just close its forced labor camps today. You've had the Pope uh, completely shake up the uh, up the Vatican Bank and, and all that. But on the other hand, you have these technocrats that have this amazingly advanced technology. And what I've seen them doing is, whether or not it was with the Northridge quake 20 years ago or with the Fukushima earthquake, if I point out, all these people are saying, well, this earthquake was artificial and they did this and they did that. My question always is, well, why? Is it just they're just killing people for fun or... Because if you wanted to do that, you could probably unleash a pretty good plague that would kind of take out half the world's population. If you wanted to kill them with earthquakes, which is a lousy way to kill people, you'd think they'd be bigger earthquakes. I mean, we just had a the Fukushima earthquake was a 9.3 and actually altered the nodal axis of Earth by uh, by six and a half inches, and it only killed 16,000 people in a rural area of Japan. I'm like, okay, if you wanted to kill people, yeah, start an earthquake in Tokyo. You know, let's kill millions of people. But that's not what they're doing. They're, they are altering, they're doing something to the sun to make sure the sun calms down. They're altering the nodal axis of the earth to make sure that the earth doesn't tip over. They're generating a series of controlled earthquakes that are loosening up the, uh, loosening up the tectonic platelets, if you will, tr- understanding we're going through a 12,000 year cycle here. 
that in which the planet goes through major changes, and they're either trying to soften them or avert them altogether. And at the same time, they're building, from what I can see, using all this technology, because we're really not at war with anybody. We're, you know, we really, on the, on the upper levels, we're very good friends with the Chinese and the Russians and everybody else. We're all, they're all subsidiary S corporations of some big black box mother corporation at the top. It's sort of like saying that, you know, Pizza Hut competes with, with, with Jack in the Box or, or Burger King, and they're all owned by the same conglomerate. Uh, which then sets up these corporations that we call the United States or uh, Germany or England or France or what have you. And, and, you know, they manipulate everybody that way. That's how they enslave everyone. But on the other side, they're also creating this gigantic star fleet, if you will, uh, that is not only moving out into the solar system, not telling us mostly about it for whatever reason, and creating some kind of planetary-wide defense grid. So if whatever does get here to invade this reality, and that has also been the, uh, the the key thing to all this inside information that I'm finding. Whether or not it was the uh, uh, the Wingmaker stuff that I stumbled across in the uh, in 1997-98, which is another thing that Al Bielik turned me on to. Which that whole thing turned into a big adventure uh, because I actually found where I think the facility was, and I actually was dealing with corporations that I thought were actually you know interacting with these guys, uh, which led to a lot of New World Order stuff behind that. But that also was all about. Uh, a, a race of beings that was on its way here from uh, from Galaxy M51 that they called the Animos. That was the whole thing of that. And now, once again, with the, with the Sands of Time material, I'm also finding that there's this reptilian core uh, that seems to be on its way here. This, this just seems to be the threat of something coming at the beginning of the next decade that seems to now correlate with the Book of Revelation, with the you know the war in heaven between Michael and the and the Great Dragon. Uh, which also, interesting enough, also correlates with the Great Pyramids of Giza, because the whole prophecy of, of the of the Giza Pyramid is that reptilian beings from Alpha, from uh, from Thuban or Alpha Draconis are responsible for the fall of man, which is the serpent in the garden that splits the male and the female, or the limbic system that now creates fear that stops us from being able to use the right hand side of the brain. Those and, and those dragons, Set, Seth, or Sutek, the serpent lords, are responsible for the downward path of mankind. Then the Pleiadians show up, and they start the upward path with the Hindu Vedas, with the uh, with the Hebrew Bible, with the Torah, with the uh, uh, the Israelites escaping Egypt, with uh, starting a new genetic strain with uh, with Abraham and Ishmael, uh, through the bestowal of Christed. Or cosmic consciousness beings like uh, Moses, and then uh, Lao Tzu, Buddha, Confucius, and then the central messianic figure being Christ. With the point being is that there is a returning messianic figure, apparently after some kind of massive appearance in the sky in 2034, called the sign in the sky of some kind of divine or extraterrestrial help or assistance. That then is the is the uh, is the precursor to the bestowal of the next Messiah, who is supposed to come on October 31st of 2039. That's the time coding of the Great Pyramids in a nutshell. And um, in Sands of Time, what I'm, what I'm pointing to, and the, the reason the book is important, is because it, it, it shows people the process of what's been going on behind the scenes for 40 years or so, how they're developing these systems, you know, what they're doing with it. And um, you know, once I get a decent publisher for the book, or just you know, publisher altogether, uh, you know, to really unleash what the time travel stuff is. I mean, you know, the whole point of this is that we're we're trying to plant seeds down through time to shift consciousness because that's the only way you can change events in time. You cannot really, if you and I were to go back and kill Hitler, as an example, it wouldn't it wouldn't help. It, it would just be Heil Schmittler. They would be all around. You know, Rudolf Hess would rise up, and you know, the, the whole thing would be even worse. It's like taking away the capstone of a pyramid and expecting the pyramid to disappear, unless you change the consciousness of the people that create someone like Hitler. You don't have a chance. But if you took a million people back in time, and they knew that Hitler was going to be a, a scumbag and kill all kinds of people, then you could shift the consciousness. If nobody was listening to Hitler, he would just be some. Crazy guy, you know, pushing a shopping cart and hanging paper, you know, doing paintings and people going, eh. So, um, you know, that's the whole point. You've got to, you've got to shift the consciousness. If one person throws himself into the wave, the wave is still going to hit the shore. But if you hit it with the equal and opposite wave, that's why what you're doing, JP, and what we're doing here 
is you know we're we're changing the conversation we're changing consciousness that you know that's the entire point of prophecy the point of prophecy is that if a lot of people listen uh you can actually avert the prophecy so that you know the best prophets are the people that are never right because we're the ones uh you know when we started talking about things like Y2K we created enough of a conversation that the government actually spent a trillion dollars to go fix a lot of the aspects of it or at least you know, put it off until the year 2034 or something. So with Sands of Time, you see one man's journey uh, through this secret government developing the weapon systems and the technology and and messing around with the UFOs. And, and you see, uh, you know, Hans Kammler and, and what his contribution is or lack of it. Uh, you know, the cooperation between the United States and the Russians on a very, on a very high level. You see this... Uh, Simon Ratterman and Ann Corbett, who are the villains of the piece, is this kind of weird Nazi who's managed to figure out a way to travel outside the time-space continuum, and um, and ultimately, it's it's really uh, it, it's Ted Humphreys' search for his father, because his father disappears when he's 17 years old, and and uh, he gets involved in all of these top secret programs because his father was uh, to find out really what happened to his dad. So that's you know it's, so it's literally a, you know a, a boy trying to save his father or find out what happened to him. And just so happens to eventually become, uh, you know, and I, you know, I didn't know anything about this guy until I actually, until I actually saw the, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, these journals that he'd left me about who he really was. He was just somebody that used to just show up and, you know, buy me lunch and, and call me on the phone and say, well, you may want to look into this and you may want to talk about that. And, and it made for great radio for me because, Everything he told me that was going to happen would then happen, and it would allow me to get out in front of 26 million people on on coast to coast, and uh, you know, back when the show was good, uh, and talk about you know, talk about what was coming and, and so, what was going on. And, so essentially, John, um, <laughs> number one was talk, or boss one was um, using you as a mouthpiece. Yes, yeah, because he wanted he wanted to use me. And the ability that we had with radio at that time, with as many people as it was, as it was going out to, to be able to shift the consciousness of the timeline. So, and it worked. And, and it worked. So we've changed the timeline that, we're, that we were headed on. Because, Absolutely. Because, like you were saying in your show earlier, Gordon Michael Scallion's map is now out of date because the, uh, the changes have been ameliorated by these people... Uh, and so, uh, and consciousness, and, and consciousness. That's, and consciousness. That's the that's the key. So, and, are they and using cord- harp to amplify consciousness meditations as well? No, no. Harp is a it's a it's a blunt instrument. It's it's a no. It doesn't yeah. have anything to do with that. Really. Yeah, I mean, th- it, this uh, is the whole thing. It's about it's a, there's this subtlety of um, you got to hit. It's, it's like you got to hit the uh, the time stream at the right angle, or you'll flip flip your board over. But it, yeah, it's very good. You, yeah. you can't over uh, like the Philadelphia experiment and Nazi Bell was is just unsubtle overuse, uh, you know, heavy handedness uh, in in using energy. They use far too much, far too quickly. And, and but that's also that's also one of the things that they're doing is that they're 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 trying to find ways to plug these big holes in the in the in the continuum because these holes are being used. It's one of the reasons why. Everything started. It's one of the reasons why all these saucers were crashing, uh, you know, in the late '40s because they were dropping out of the time-space continuum and they didn't know where they were. Right? It didn't. It also we were blasting them out of the sky with the RF-27 uh, microwave towers in New Mexico. We were we were putting up entire microwave grids, which is what overloaded the the two disks that crashed at Roswell and Corona. Uh, actually, one exploded. Actually, they dropped into a microwave grid and the microwaves. And that's also how we developed a weapon, uh, which is called the the, the Thor's hammer. The Thor's hammer is a microwave pulse weapon that interferes with the uh, with the proton exchange inside the uh, inside the ships, which allows us to shoot it down. But as you saw from you know its use, it, it, you can't use this thing. You can't use this thing below fifty thousand feet because it blacks out everything. It takes out all the uh, all the electrical grids and all that. But uh, we were experimenting with microwave grids, and uh, there were two saucers that dropped out of the time space continuum and were cruising across the Mexican desert and one exploded and crashed into the other one and that's where the debris field was uh that was Roswell and then the other one fluttered down and crashed in Corona which is where we found the uh the actual ship and the dead aliens and all that technology that then got absorbed by General Arthur Trudeau and Philip Corso who were you know Corso wrote his book uh, day after Roswell 
uh, all that technology got absorbed into what they called the Foreign Technology Division of the Pentagon. And then piece by piece, it got dropped into different programs. They took the, uh, the night vision lenses, for example, off the aliens, and they dropped that into Bell Laboratories, which then became night vision uh, lasers. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a ruby laser that they used that was the basis of lasers. Uh, they had an integrated circuit board that they gave to Shockley's team. And to this day, Shockley never said he invented the integrated circuit. He said it was all part of the team and all that. Well, they dropped this integrated circuit to this team. They gave it to Shockley and said, here you go, back engineer. Well, we got this from the French or something. And, uh, you know, so that was, uh, and that was all Philip Corso, uh, in his book Day After Roswell, where he talked about that, where he was working for General Arthur Trudeau in the Foreign Technology Division of the Pentagon. So we got dragged kicking and screaming with integrated circuits, lasers, night vision goggles, uh, base computers, uh, everything we have today from things literally falling out of the sky in the late 40s. So, but that's another reason why, you know, you could also say the Bermuda Triangle is a huge rip in the continuum as well, which actually then takes you into a series of Einstein Rosen bridges, uh, into other dimensional realities. Um, you know, Billy Meyer has photographs where the Pleiadians took him into the Bermuda Triangle and he went to a, a parallel Earth where, uh, dinosaurs had not become extinct and he took a lot of photos and, you know, all that. So, I, you know, there's just, it's a lot of stuff. I mean, it's, you know, when you go through as many, you know, I mean, I put together hundreds of hours of interviews with these people and, you know, not only being on the radio, but being in television and, and, you know, working with this kind of stuff, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of it. And it's, you know, the more you know, the less you know, unfortunately. And, and with Sands of Time, even, there's still a, a lot of mysteries that are, that are, uh, uh, that are still out there. And, you know, there's still more material in the book. It's just, it was such a Herculean effort to put it all together. And, um, you know, and I'm still trying to just find somebody to, you know, a decent publisher to come at me and say, okay, we'll, you know, be happy to publish your book for you and, uh, uh, get it out there to the public. And how about you write another one and we pay you and, you know, that sort of thing. And that, that's, for some reason, the whole agents and literary agent thing is, has, uh, the whole agent thing in general has just eluded me. So I'm, I guess I'm just so used to being the Lone Ranger and, and, uh, you know, the high plains well, drifter out you here. You know who you can trust. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> who, you know, you don't want anybody messing with your book, nope. saying, "Oh, I don't like that. I don't like this." You know, oh, t- change that, tone that down a bit. You know, that looks a bit weird. You know, and all that stuff. Uh, but it's it's fascinating. You know, I think it's a really necessary story. So, because because it goes into um, subjects that I've been talking about on my show for you know, two and a half years, three years, um, such as which is the the tear of the Philadelphia experiment. And right. how how we can repair it, you know. Um, uh, so we've we've got a couple of questions as well that have come in through the uh, through the chat room, and okay. um, let's let's Be see nice. if we can weave some of those in. So first of all, um, yeah, that was the, uh, the, the, the scroll back. There we go. Um, yeah. So does this mean, for instance, that there would be repercussions in twenty twenty three? Um, that being that uh, um, the Eldridge is traveling twenty years at a time. Um, no, it's st- it actually stopped. It was it, it was a sixty year cycle that it was traveling through, uh, and so it came to the end of its tether in uh, in two thousand three, and then snapped back to nineteen forty three. Does it not snap back sixty years earlier? No, it just it just went it it jumped forward, it, but it jumped forward in twenty degree increments. In other words, you have to imagine that the the time space continuum again, like an accordion, is collapsed, yeah. and then you shoot a bullet through it. So the, uh, apparently, it appeared in twenty year increments, uh, causing uh, uh, disruptions in the time stream. Well, rips and disruption in the, in disruptions in the time stream in twenty year increments. So if we wanted to use those to travel backwards in time. Uh, you know, you and I could only jump to, uh, to a space where the hole is. We'd only be able to jump to 2003 or 1963 or, or, you know, it'd be, it'd be, it would be in these 20 year increments. So it'd be 43, 50 or 63, and then it'd be 73, 83, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's why it's, that, that's why you had the massive, uh, that's why you had the blackout on the East Coast because mm-hmm. as it snapped to the end of its tether, so to speak, uh, the ship caused a, a, a you know, a, a gigantic, Disruption in the time space field before it then snapped back to 43. And, and, and by the way, we used, we, we used that technology again. We successfully did the experiment without any of those side effects in October on another, um, on another ship called the USS Martha's Vineyard, which was a, a minesweeper. And, um, which was a minesweeper and we successfully managed to jump it about 300 miles or so and it, it, it actually uh, did a time jump of about two weeks, uh, without any of those anomalies. So it was very much, Whoever this weird K group was, 
insisting that we do it at this particular time, uh, at that particular low point. And you remember as well, uh, you know, August of 1943, uh, virtually everybody on the planet was killing each other. I mean, you know, it was full-scale war between, you know, the United States and the Germans and the Japanese, and I mean, the entire planet was at war. You can't get lower than that. And isn't it odd that in August of 2003, once again, you have the entire planet at war. You've got the United States and Iraq and Afghanistan and, uh, you know, riling everything up, uh, you know, again at that, at, at, at that biorhythmic low point in the, uh, uh, in the aspect. So, so there you go. And as I said, Al Bielik was the one that told me, he said, watch this date. Watch August 12th, 13th of 2003. He told me this years in advance. I mean, he told me this in, you know, 84, you know, I don't know, in 84, like 89 to 91 or so. And then uh, when I wrote the article, uh, in my newsletter in February of uh, 2003, I said, well, watch for this happening. And by the way, the Philadelphia technology uh, is now being used or was used on a... All right. Well, uh, I've uh, landed the TARDIS again. We got uh, we got disrupted by the uh, the Daleks. Anyway, so I'm just going to try and bring... Ah, oh, Sean, are you there? There we go. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. Get, I reconnected. Okay, yeah. we good? Yeah, so just just as you said, um, what they did was using Philadelphia technology, and that was when, that was when oh. we lost you. <laughs> uh, the Philadelphia technology was later used, and they successfully used it uh, several months later uh, on a test on another ship called the USS Martha's Vineyard. And uh, then it was used on a, uh, on a class of, uh, of minesweepers called the Ospreys. Uh, there were about a dozen of them, and uh, they have three big engines in the back that are made by Marconi, and these three uh, engines allow the ship to go insubstantial. Uh, in other words, if you're coming on a, uh, am I still am I still on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, keep going. Okay. Uh, if you're coming up on a mine, for example, you can flip a switch and the whole thing, the whole ship goes basically trans- insubstantial, and you just slide over it and you back up, and you know it takes you like a second out of the time space continuum, and all, apparently also allows the craft to. Uh, uh, to teleport from place to place. And apparently the Ospreys are being phased out, and now there's a new class, which are called the Avengers, uh, which are using this technology. But there's no metal on the ships at all. The, the ships are all made out of uh, uh, a completely non-metallic materials. Everything has to be fiberglass or uh, 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 certain types of uh, you know, ferrous porcelain. Um, so it's interesting. So that's, so that's what they're actually... Uh, uh, that's what they're, uh, that's what they're using it for. Wow. Where now, are these factories to make all these enormous things? Well, it's just boats. I mean, you know, you just make a boat that has no metal with it. The other, the other factories are in Italy. Yeah. Uh, the engines, actually, the electromagnetic drives are made by Marconi International out of out of uh, out of Rome. Uh, the other stuff is, you know, if you really want to go where you know there's ETs with bases and you know all that stuff, you got to go to the jungles of Brazil because the Matt Moros Plain has uh, uh, that's where all the German technology went. That's where the Palladian technology is. It really is a kind of a third phase of man. Uh, coming out of the Matt Morris plane in, in Brazil, at least according to this this guy Adrian, who was one of these uh, who came back with photos of of uh, these you know hundred meter across uh, four of them all landing on these pads down there. So, but that's the, that's the weird reality I live in, knowing people that do you know all this weird <laughs> stuff with swastikas on them. No, as when the Germans when the Germans started going out into space, the the you know they came in contact with whoever was out there that said. You know we're not gonna, you know we're not gonna put up with this crazy Nazi stuff anymore. And although there was, you know, this is a whole other thing. You know, there was a psychic named Maria Orsich from Zagreb who oh, yeah. was channeling, was channeling these, uh, uh, was channeling the the, the Sumi uh, from Aldebaran who claimed to actually be the Sumerians and that they were here 500, 500 million years ago and that and uh, uh, this was uh, this was uh, Rudolf Hess. And this guy, uh, Von C. Bottendorf, who ran the Thubel Society, and, and she was giving them technical plans and writing out Sumerian and all this stuff. And people don't, people don't understand. I mean, here's the biggest mystery of the 20th century. How the hell did the Germans go from sop with camels, biplanes, and basically aircraft tied together with canvas and wire to within 15 years having potentially, you know, implosion drives and, and, uh, you know, mercury drives and, and inter, and, and interplanetary travel, uh, you know, flying saucers. Where the hell does that come from? It just comes around of nowhere, and you can trace everything back to this crazy psychic, uh, you know, Maria Orsich and her Vril Daman, her you know, long-haired naked girls who were channeling these beings from Aldebaran that, that claim to uh, be giving these German scientists all of this technical data for them to achieve what was called uh, Wurmflugen or space flight, so that they could actually take a a, a Hanabu or Vril craft uh, saucer ship. 
uh, to Aldebaran, which is uh, the star in the Eye of Taurus. So it's a uh, it's crazy. And then she disappears in 1945 as well and simply says, we're all going home. And that's the last thing from her. But that's a whole, that's all part of the next book. Once I get, you know, Tempest Fugit and part two of Sands of Time together, there's a lot of stuff that has to do with the time travel stuff that goes back to, um, you know, Nazis from the future communicating with, with Maria Zagreb in 1919. And, you know, the original Germans and how they got all this stuff. So there's that, that's where the, that's where the messing with the time stream happens is how the Germans got all this weird technology. Yeah, and uh, Simon Ratterman, and uh, yes, yeah, Simon well, Ratterman. and <laughs> you know some some characters that are straight out of like sci-fi Bond movie meets meets you know um, I don't know <laughs> I don't <it's, laughs> it meets a sci-fi Bond movie it meets, okay. it meets a sci-fi Bond movie really yeah it's it, you know if everything that you like about sci-fi movies and everything you like about Bond movies is in this book this is just the kind of it's got that edge of you know um, trying to fix a, a, a drastic situation. Um, I was always a big, a big fan of, of a fan of Ian Fleming, and you know I loved all the Ian Fleming Bond books, and, and so much of my writing style was really a you know it was kind of John Steinbeck meets Hemingway meets meets. I always thought they were a little too flowery, but Ian Fleming was the, the best. He was the greatest, and mm-hmm. I've always taken my action sequences. I've always thought that you know if I, if I could become even close. To the kind of stuff that Ian Fleming did, and you know, if, you know as, as Henningway said, if you're going to be a writer, be the best writer. So, uh, I've certainly I've tried to do that. So, uh, I got some other questions here. I don't know how much time we have, but I've you know I don't know if you want to ask me these other questions in the chat room. Oh my God, there's so many, and, and they're all like really <laughs> well, they could go. Um, you have a lot of questions because I don't have many. I'm just seeing like five or six. All so. right. Well, uh, there's, there's the. Um, uh, Greenheart was saying that this sounds like a dream he had where he visited a series of interconnected aquariums with genetic experiments. He was talking about uh, um, the the videotape that uh, the, uh, the guy Of Dulce. Yeah. The, well, let me, yeah. And let me give you one other explanation of that as well. The other explanation, and this really rattled some cages, when we did the testing on Dulce, I took this to MUFON. I took this to Walt Anderson, these people at MUFON, who let no one else speak other apparently than Linda Moulton Howe and and Stanton Friedman, uh, I think Stanton Friedman speaks for free, but they got to pay his beard like ten thousand dollars. So it's a uh, you know, and I said, look, we've proven for the first time that this base exists. We have people who've been inside this base. We have, uh, you know, we can do this whole presentation and 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 move on. Who I call the morons, ultimately finding out nothing. Their whole attitude was like, eh, you know, no thanks. You know, and this was years ago. And here's there's one other aspect to this. There's the good possibility that, that there were no aliens inside Dulce. I'm not saying that to, to dispute the book. I'm just saying that if we're growing these things in tanks, what they were doing is that they were they were growing very simplistic biological entities. The only thing that's complicated about human beings is our reproductive and and digestive systems. If you take those out you basically just come up with a kind of a complicated frog versus a monkey, I guess you, you could say. You just got a brain with the, you know, with a, with a spine and arms and legs hanging off of it. There's a good possibility that we're actually growing or breeding, if you will, uh, work, workers for these bases, especially if you're doing heinous genetic experiments where you're crossbreeding, you know, human DNA with, I don't know, octopuses or something, and then you come up with lawyers or, I, I don't know, you know, or eagles or fish or maybe you're creating mermen. I mean, this really is the, the age of Atlantis uh, if you're talking about it. So I came up with a whole other explanation for this, saying maybe the reason you're seeing these greys with the military is they're not extraterrestrial at all. They're these beings that they're growing uh, as a slave labor force, if you will, inside these inside these various bases. Because the biggest thing about the bases is is security. It's hard. It's hard for people to keep their mouths shut. Oh, are we over already? Oh no. That was it. I mean, that went by so quickly. Sean, maybe one day we'll come back. Uh, I want. I want to. I want to read that second part. I want that. You know. I, I want you to tell it. Tell me it personally. Thank you very much, Sean David Morton. Thanks a lot. Uh, See you on Wednesday. StrangeUniverseRadio.com. That's Strange Universe Radio. Go and buy his book. Um, uh, get the ebook. You can get the, the thing. He reads it out for you. Bedtime stories. 